Welcome accounting boffins. Yes, remember we are busy with cost accounting and let us just do a bit of revision to see exactly what we've done so far. Okay, let's go into our slides. Remember what we said, cost accounting deals with businesses that do what? You have a business that makes products and then sells. So this business produces the products and then sells them and that's what we refer to as a manufacturing enterprise right okay and then we said that manufacturing enterprises are different why are they different because they have different costs to consider okay your trading concern buys a finished product adds a markup to it and sells the product However, your manufacturing concern produces the item with all its cost components and thereafter adds a markup and sells it. So you can clearly see a distinct difference between an enterprise dealing with buying and selling and a manufacturing enterprise. Okay. So therefore, it becomes imperative, it becomes absolutely critical, what? For a manufacturing enterprise to do their costing accurately. In other words, they need to know exactly what was the cost that were incurred in manufacturing that particular item in order to arrive at the correct cost price. Got that? Because obviously, understand this, you are manufacturing the product. That means you, 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 you're making the product and attaching a cost price to each of its components. And thereafter, obviously, you're going to sell that product. So this would then determine the correct selling price as well. It's only once you determine the cost price can you then work out the correct selling price. The costing process, obviously, here, yeah, focuses on what we refer to as cost accounting. Clear? So this entire cost processing is called cost accounting. Okay. There were ledger accounts that we referred to, right? Let's recap. And we said these are new ledger accounts, and you must know these ledger accounts because if you look at our previous lessons, we went through these accounts in detail explaining each account and the origins of each entry. That's important. Okay, so we looked at the finished goods stock account. We looked at the consumable store stock account, uh, finished goods, we've done that one already, and ob obviously the consumable store stock. So basically what we said here is you can see these two are repeated, but these are important accounts that we will be dealing with. Okay, now we came to our cost accounts. And we said there are three cost accounts that impact on the manufacturing of a product. Now, this is important. The three cost accounts that impact directly on the cost of a product would be, one, your direct material, two, your direct labor, and three, your factory overhead cost. All of these costs here impact directly on the manufacturing of a particular product. Clear. Then we went on and we dealt with the other two cost accounts. That was your administration cost and selling and distribution cost. Those two cost accounts have nothing to do with the making of the product, but rather with the selling of the product. And therefore, they go into your trading account and your profit and loss account, right? We've dealt with these accounts as well. So this is just basically a recap and a review of all the accounts that we have been dealing with thus far. There we go. We said, finally, you will have a trading account. Obviously, the two trading accounts are your sales and your cost of sales. And thereafter, your gross profit in your profit and loss account here you will now deal with what? Your admin cost and your selling and distribution cost. So clearly you can see three cost accounts, 
go to the manufacturing of an item, namely direct material, direct labor, and your factory overheads, right? So in any item that you look at, the costing component is made up of material, labor, and factory overheads. Great stuff. Let's move on. Here we have an appetizer for you. Just something for you to get okay with, to get into the section to understand how we deal with certain things, right? So let's look at the information that we have. We are told, summary of the transactions, you have cash purchases, 40,000, credit purchases, 25,000, carriage on purchases paid for cash, 2,000, raw materials issued to production, 63,600, raw material stock at the beginning, raw material stock at the end. You are expected now to use this information to draft up your raw materials stock account, okay? Let's go right into it. We start off by saying, you start off this account obviously with a balance at the beginning of your financial year, right? Or your financial period, or the period under review. So we can see now that the stock of raw materials was beginning of the year 16,800. So there we go, debit side, asset account, the balance brought down 16,800. Got it? Okay, let's, con let's do the debit side of the account first. Did we buy materials for cash? Certainly we did. How much did we buy? We purchased for cash 40,000. Clearly you can see, there's my entry, a debit to raw material stock, contra entry is bank, I'm debiting my stock account because it's an asset increasing in value. Got it? Okay. Next, did we buy goods on credit? When I say goods now, I'm referring to materials, right? Yes, we bought on credit for how much? 25,000, therefore my contra entry, debit to raw material stock, Assets increasing in value, credit creditors control, here's my entry, a debit to my raw material stock, 25,000 Rand. So clearly you can see from this account now, watch the information that we have. We had stock of raw materials of 16,800 at the beginning of the financial year. We purchased raw material for cash. How much? 40,000. We purchased raw materials on credit for how much? 25,000. Okay, what else do we know? We know that uh, carriage on purchases, remember we said, all the costs incurred in bringing the raw materials to our place of manufacture, to where our factory is situated, all the costs incurred would form part and parcel of my cost of my raw materials, right? So I paid carriage, to transfer the goods into my factory, and there we have carriage and purchases, 2,000 Rand, therefore you've got your carriage. Now remember it was paid for in cash, so you debiting your raw materials, crediting bank, you can put carriage in brackets, just to give you an indication that that was the carriage that you paid for, and that's your 2,000 Rand. Okay, now, at this point here, it's important to understand that two things can happen. You can either be told how much raw materials you have left over at the end of the year, or you could be told how much raw materials was issued for production, okay? Now in this particular example, you are told that your raw materials issued to production amounted to 63,600, immediately you know that that is your direct materials that were actually used to produce the goods that you were manufacturing. Therefore, you took those goods and you transferred them into your direct materials cost account. Watch, it's taken out of raw materials. I credit my raw materials account, 63,600, and I debit my direct materials cost. Watch this entry, there we go. Can you see direct, direct material cost is then debited with the actual amount 
of raw materials that were used in the production process. Clear? OK. Now, remember I said there's two ways of doing this. The other way, the, the question you could have used the information by looking at the raw materials on hand at the end of the year amounted to 20,200. Now, this year again, can you see, if you bring in the 20,200, which is your balance carry down, balance brought down, that would give you the balance of raw materials at the end of the year. So what is it that you need to take note of? Very, very important. In this particular example, you are given both figures. But generally, you would be given one figure, and the other would be a missing figure. So watch this. If you are given your closing value of raw materials, that's the 20,200, this one here, if you are given that one, then the direct materials becomes your missing figure, right? And by the same token, if you are given your direct materials issued to production, then your closing balance would obviously, obviously be the raw materials on hand. So in this year, you can now clearly see that you have transferred the amount from where? From your raw materials stock account into your cost account, namely direct materials cost. OK, so remember, in our previous lessons, we spoke about the flow of information. As you can see, from my raw materials stock account into my direct, uh, into my direct materials cost account, and from my direct materials cost account into my work in process. You can see, watch here, from your direct materials cost account, you're going to transfer into your work in process account. So what I've done in this particular example for you, I've just taken one item, namely your raw materials, and I've shown you the raw materials stock account, where we purchase and all the information, remember, the external transactions? Right. Thereafter, we did an internal entry where we transferred, let's see it, from the raw material stock, we transferred into direct materials cost account, OK? And from your direct materials cost account, eventually, that figure would end up into your work in process. As you can see, in this ledger account, you close off your direct materials into your work in process. So here's the flow of information. Once again, recap. Raw material stock account into direct material cost account. Finally, from that cost account into the work in process. Clearly, you can see how the information is taken from the external records Internally, we move it, and it finally ends up in the work in process account, which we also say is also called your manufacturing account. OK, guys, I'm sure you want to know more about uh, manufacturing and looking at a particular question that is a possible examination question. So in order to do that, you need to stay here, right here with us. Let's take a quick break, and we'll be back in a jiffy. Welcome back, accounting boffins, right? Remember, we're busy with cost accounting. We're looking at a particular question now where you are expected to do certain things. Firstly, what is expected of you? What does this question want you to do? One, they want you to complete the following ledger accounts, namely your raw materials cost account, your work in progress, and your finished goods. Now, notice, these are the accounts that are normally asked for when this question appears in a question paper or in an activity that you are expected to do. So these three accounts are critical because remember, if you understand these three accounts, then the rest of it becomes chocolate cake. As easy as chocolate cake, right? So you know my favorite. OK. And then obviously, you're also asked to calculate the factory overhead. OK, let's look at the information that we have. We are told 
that star manufacturers produces and sells towels at a markup of 50% on cost. Now, every bit of information given to you is not there to fill the paper or fill the spaces, but it is relevant and you are expected to use that information, right? So keep this in the back of your minds. We'll come back to it at a later stage. For now, we know that they are manufacturing and they're using a markup of 50% on cost. Okay, what do, we, what do we have here? We are told that raw materials, firstly, information regarding raw materials is 240,000 bought for cash, right? Two, 360,000 bought on credit, right? Notice something new here. 20,000 goods were bought on credit were returned, right? That in other words, we bought goods and these were returned to, their, to the suppliers, either incorrect or defective, whatever the reason may be. And then we had carriage and raw materials paid during the period amounted to 5,000 rand. So all of this information now, we're going to use to draw up our raw materials stock account. Let's do that immediately. We'll come back to this information here. Let's look at this information that we want here. There we go. We are told, one, the raw materials at the beginning of the year, right? This one here, in this particular example, is pre-populated for you, meaning it's already appearing in the ledger account, right? So what they've done in this particular activity, they've pre-populated your opening balance of raw materials. Then, did we purchase raw materials for cash? Yes, we did. How much? 240,000 rand. You can see here, there's a 240,000 rand bought for cash. Now, double entry, debit raw materials stock, credit bank. That's your ledger entry. Clearly, you can see, we are, with us, the emphasis now is on raw materials, isn't it? We're not concerned about the bank account per se, because that entry is not required. Required for you to show is the raw materials stock account. Okay, so there we go. There's my bank entry I purchased for 240,000 rand. Done and dusted, next entry. 360,000 rand was bought on credit. We purchased raw materials on credit. Once again, use your prior accounting knowledge. You bought on credit, so credit is control. Debit, raw materials stock, credit. Credit is control, and here we go. There's your credit is control. 360,000 Rand worth of raw materials were bought on credit. Okay, going back to my information, we said 20,000 Rand goods that were bought on credit were returned. That means we returned these to our creditors. So your contra entry, this is important. Your contra entry is what? A debit to creditors control, why? To reduce your liability. And a credit to my raw materials cost account, here you can see is the return of material to my suppliers. I said either defective, uh, not what we ordered, whatever the reason may be. So these raw materials were returned to our suppliers. Okay, while we're at this point here, Although the question does not ask for it, what if we had identified raw materials that were stolen? Think about it. There was a theft at our premises. Raw materials to the value of 10,000 rand were stolen. Immediately it rings a bell. You go to debit your loss account because you've lost 10,000 rand worth of materials and it will be a credit in your raw materials cost account. Can you see that? Because you're reducing the value of your raw materials. I said it's not applicable in this particular question, but it could be something that could feature in an exam question or an activity that you are doing in class. Okay, coming back to this particular question, the next one we have here is carriage on raw materials was paid 5,000 Rand. Therefore, look at your bank. You paid, it was paid by cash, double entry, debit your raw materials cost account, credit the bank account, 5,000 Rand. There's the entry, 5,000 Rand. I said these two balances were pre-populated for you. So now, 
if those two balances were pre-populated, in other words, they've put in your opening balance and your closing balance, your missing figure will therefore be, come, at this stage you should be shouting out the answer. Yes, it is your direct materials cost. In other words, that's the actual amount of material that we used in the production process. Okay? Make sense? All the raw materials that we purchased coming into my account, all the raw materials that are going out because of return and because of what I got left over, and voila, there's the figure you're looking for. The direct materials that were actually used, that were, that were sent to the factory for processing. That's the figure that you're looking for. Your direct materials cost account. Clear? Good. We now go on to the information, and we are expected to work out the work in process account, but we're going to come back to this account. Let's just do something before we get there. Let's look at other information that we have. Right, we are told here as well that the following wages and salaries were paid during the month, right? In other words, you have paid wages and salaries during this month or the period under review. Now identify them. What are they? Factory workers, 180,000 rand. So clearly, the moment you see the word factory workers, you immediately identify that figure as what? As your direct labor. Okay? So, from this information, you are expected to extract, what are you looking for? The direct labor cost. In this case here, you can clearly see it was 180,000 rand. You also had factory cleaners and supervisors at 84,000 rand. But we do know that anybody not directly involved in the manufacturing of the good or service, rather not the, the service here, Anybody not working in the production process, right? That person's wages, although they may be in the factory, does not constitute direct labor, but rather indirect labor. So that cost would go into my factory overheads. Clear? So factory wages, only those people actively involved in the making of the product, in the production line. That's your factory wages. Okay, so 180,000 was identified. So therefore, if we go back here now into my work in process, right? Firstly, I said opening balance pre-populated, given to you already on the debit side. Closing balance also given to you, right? Now, we've already calculated the raw materials stock. Can you recall? Just a few minutes ago, we worked out that figure to be 600,000. And you could clearly see the transfer from the direct materials cost into the working process or the working progress account. So that one we know where it came from. Then we've identified our direct labor as the 180,000 rand. So therefore, we've got our direct labor 180,000. 80,000 rand. Clear? So we've already got the two components making up the article. Remember, it's direct material plus direct labor plus factory overheads. So in, in, in doing this calculation, when you're working out the work in process account, the three things you look for, material, labor, and factory overheads. Got it? Okay. We now go to factory overheads. And we are told for factory overheads that there was certain information that we needed to use for factory overheads. Let's get to it. OK, here we go. They're telling you rent paid amounted to 270,000 rand. That was a total amount of rent that you paid for your premises, the entire building. Right. But the factory does not occupy the entire building. The factory only occupies 
of the floor space. So what do we do? This is what we do. We say, fine, take my 270,000, right, times the 60%, because the factory only occupies 60% of the premises, multiplied by 60% to give you a figure of 162,000. Therefore, clearly you can see, there's my 270,000 times the 60% for the factory to give me the factory amount of 162,000 Rand. So this is an adjustment that you need to process. You can't use the entire 270,000 for the factory. It's not fair. The factory has only pays its proportion of the rental. Right, the next one we are told here is that factory maintenance of 54,000 Rand was paid during the month. However, 6,000 uh, 6, for a machine that will be fixed only during June 2019. In other words, you've paid a total of 54,000 Rand, but the 6,000 that you have paid is not for this financial year. Therefore, it cannot be part of my factory overheads for this financial year. So what do I do with it? Watch what I do here. We go to the 54,000, which is my factory maintenance, minus the 6,000 Rand will give you a figure of 48,000 Rand. I'm only interested in this year's incomes and expenses as it relates to the factory. Okay. The next one we have here is our consumable stores. Let's find the information for the consumable stores. We've got the factory maintenance. Uh, maybe earlier on, let's check the earlier slide. There should be information there. Okay, here goes, guys. Let's look at this here. We are told that at the end of the month, consumable stores of 400 Rand were still on hand. Okay, so what do you do now? You go back into your information and remember all the consumables that you had on hand at the beginning plus what you purchased minus what you had left over at the financial year end. That's the important part of your calculation. So watch this once again. You had on hand 800, was pre-populated for you. You purchased a further 2,400 of consumable stores, but the adjustment told you that there were 400 Rand worth of consumable stores on hand. Therefore, minus the 4,000, so it will be 800 plus 2,400 minus the 400 will give you a figure of 2,800. Clear? Okay, what else do we know about the other workers that we had. Remember we said that, um, let's just find it, here we go. We had in the factory people not directly involved in the production process, however, they were working in the factory. What, who were they? Your factory cleaners and your supervisors, 84,000 Rand. This therefore means we have to bring in that component, which is the indirect labor, into my calculation, there's the 84,000 Rand. Clear? So indirect labor, as it affects the factory, would appear under factory overheads. Okay, next one. Uh, we are told depreciation must be written off as follows. Factory machinery, one, uh, 12,000 Rand. Delivery vehicle, 4,000. Be careful. Anything dealing with delivery, selling and distribution, no impact on the factory. We only interested in the factory, factory machinery, 12,000 Rand. Therefore, if you look at this one here, you will see you bring in your depreciation of your factory at 12,000 Rand. And the last one we are dealing with here is your Electricity for the month amounted to 22,000. Three quarters must be allocated to the factory. 
And therefore, you can clearly see that 75% of 22,000 will give you your 16,500. Right, now, coming back to my information regarding my accounts. Remember what I said? I bring in my factory overheads, right? So I've got my opening balance, raw material cost, direct labor, factory overhead cost, I've got my closing balance, my finished goods is my missing figure, or the balancing figure. That figure is taken into my finished goods stock account. Once again, opening balance is given, closing balance is given, right? I bring in my work in progress, and voila, I have my cost of sales as my missing figure. Look at the link between these accounts, work in process, flowing into the finished goods stock accounts. Okay? And I think the last question we had to do here was calculate the cost of one finished towel if we manufacture 13,750, and there obviously you'll take your cost of production, which was 1,100,000, divided by the number of units you had produced, the number of units that you had produced to give you a unit cost of 80 rand per towel. So clearly, guys, you can see it is important to understand the link between these accounts, right? We're going to take a quick break, and we'll see you just now. Welcome back, accounting boffins, right? Remember, we're busy with cost accounting. We've dealt with all the important ledger accounts. Quick re recap, remember, a reminder is beneficial. Okay, so when we're talking about variable costs, what are we talking about? We are talking about those costs that vary. In, by vary, we mean they go up and down. They change. Why? Why do they change? Because they are in direct proportion to the number of goods that are produced. Let's take an example. If you are producing 100 items, right? Obviously, let's just make it a very simple calculation, and you're using uh, 10 laborers. If you now produce 1,000 articles, are you still going to use 10 laborers? Then you're going to be a slave driver, okay? And we, we're not, definitely not going to do that. So what do we say? As the manufacturing increases, as we increase our production levels, the, the, the cost will vary proportionate to production. In other words, if you increase your production, the cost of this will increase. If you, if you decrease your production, the costs will also decrease. That's what we mean by variable cost. Now, what are your variable costs? What are they? Let's identify them. Number one, direct material cost. Okay? First one. Number two, direct labor cost. So, again, you can see it is a variable cost because I explained earlier on, the more you produce, the more labor you require. And the third one that falls in this category will be your selling and distribution cost. In other words, the more you produce, the more you're going to sell. The more you're going to sell, the higher your selling costs are going to be. These three are your variable cost. Okay, then we move on to fixed cost. What do we mean by fixed cost? By fixed cost, are those costs that remain constant irrespective of the number of units produced. Let's look at this here. Fixed costs remain the same irrespective of the number of goods that are being produced. Okay? And in this category of costs, we have two categories. That means two cost accounts would fall under the, under the category of your fixed cost. What are they? One will be your factory overheads.
and the second one will be your admin costs. Again, let me illustrate by means of an example. You have rented premises, right? Whether you produce five items or whether you produce 500 items, the rent for the premises will stay the same, right? So within the umbrella, we're looking at the broad category of factory overheads. We say all the accounts that fall within the ambit of factory overheads would be regarded as a fixed cost. So we're looking at, at factory overheads as being your fixed cost. The next one that we look at is your admin cost. The administrative section of your building, whether you produce or you don't produce, you've got to hire those people to do the admin work. And therefore, that cost would also fall within the category of your fixed cost. So once again, five cost accounts, three are variable, two are fixed. Okay. What do we mean by break even? A very, very important consideration when it comes to cost accounting. Here goes. The number of goods that we need to make and sell in order to cover all our costs. And that's what we refer to as the break-even point. That's the point at which we have neither made a profit on, on the sales or have we made a loss on the sale of our goods. It's at the point where we break even. At that point, your profit or loss is equal to zero. Right, that's what we mean by the break even point. Okay, now we have a question where we are expected to calculate the break even point, okay? Firstly, what is the indicator? Remember, when you are writing your exam, you are given a formula sheet, however, you need to know the headings of each of those formula. It's important. So you need to know the formula in order to identify it on that sheet. Right? So what is my break-even point? It's my total fixed cost. Right? So it's my total fixed cost. And this will be in rands divided by your contribution per unit, okay? And what is your contribution per unit? It's your selling price per unit minus your variable cost per unit. That's important. So you must know this indicator and you must understand it as well. So here's my cost, I'm told. There's my direct material, there's my direct labor, there's my factory overheads, there's my admin cost, there's my selling and distribution, and there's my selling price per unit. Okay, I am now expected to work out the break even point. What am I gonna do? Step number one, I can see that I want to identify my fixed costs first, because I need that figure in rands. So I go into my information and I say, right, there's my fixed cost, one, and there's my fixed cost, two. So there are my two fixed costs. What are they? Factory overheads plus my admin cost. So it's 124,000 plus 28,000. So here you see 124,000 plus my 28,000. So I have that as my numerator, right? 124,000 and the 28,000. Divided by my contribution per unit. What is my contribution per unit? My contribution per unit is, watch, selling price per unit. My selling price per unit is 120, right? So therefore, I say 120 minus what? My variable cost per unit. I go back and identify my variable cost per unit. Remember, direct materials is a variable cost, direct labor is a variable cost, and selling and distribution is a variable cost. So clearly what have I done here? I've identified my variable cost, 
I want their cost per unit. So materials per unit is 34. Watch. Minus 34. Go back. Find my labor, which is 46. 46. And then my selling and distribution, which was 16. Go back there. There's the 16. So here you can see, there's my variable cost per unit, right? The 34 plus 46 plus 16. If you do this calculation, you'll see that you, if you add the 124 plus the 28 will give you 152,000, right? That's your total fixed cost. What's your contribution per unit? My contribution per unit is 24. Where did it come from? 120 minus 34 plus 46 plus 16 gave me 24. Now watch, this is critical, guys. When you're doing this one here in an exam, in an activity, when you are working, the answer will always be in units. Clear? So what does this indicator tell you? This indicator informs you that in order for this factory to break even, they need to produce 6,334 units. In other words, they have to make 6,334 units have to be made and sold in order to break even. Clear? So now you have a question that says, we'll come back to our summary just now. Let's just do this here. If you are told 6,334 units, was my break-even point, right? This factory manufactured 5,000 units. What are you going to say? You are expected to respond to this now. So one is to calculate the break-even point, and the second one, the second part is to analyze the break-even point. Clearly you can see that this factory is not meeting the break-even point. In other words, they're incurring a loss. Why? They are manufacturing below the break-even point, and as a result of that, they're going to be making a loss. How many units are they the under manufacturing? Obviously, if you do the maths there, it's one, three, three, four. They are under the break-even point by 1,334 units. Okay. If you have another scenario and you are told that the break-even point is 6334 and we have manufactured um, 8334 units, right? Now, analyze this scenario. What can you see? Clearly you can see that we are manufacturing 2,000 units above the break-even point. So clearly, this particular business here, or this scenario here, this business is manufacturing and making a profit. Why? Because they are manufacturing above the break-even point. So very, very important, accounting boffins, is to one, calculate the break-even point, and number two, also make sure that you are able to comment on the break-even point, right? So what do you do? You comment on the level of production with the break-even point. Going back to our example, look at this one here. We said we manufactured 5,000. Our break-even was 6,334. Clearly, we were under the break-even point by 1,334 units. Clearly, we're making a loss in this particular enterprise. Why? We're manufacturing below the break-even point. However, if we're now manufacturing the second scenario, this was another factory. Remember the other example I gave you? We said the break-even point is 6334, but you are manufacturing 8334. Clearly, you can see you are manufacturing above the break-even even point. You're manufacturing 2,000 units above the break-even point, and clearly, if you do that, you can see that you're going to be making a profit on 
2,000 units. So that, guys, is your break-even point. Okay, another important consideration that I want you to take note of is sometimes you are given your floor space in the form of a ratio. For example, you are told that the factory and the selling and distribution and the admin section are sharing the premises in the ratio 5 is to 3 is to 2. Okay, what do we do here? The most important, the most important thing for you to do here is to A, 5 plus 3 is 8 plus 2 is equal to 10. So 5 over 10 will be for the factory, 3 over 10 will be for the showroom, and 2 over 10 would be for your admin section. So if you have to allocate an expense, for example, let's take uh, uh, 10,000 Rand for the rental. When you're doing your calculation, watch. 5 over 10 times 10,000 over 1, OK? Obviously, you can see that answer is 5,000 Rand. So 5,000 Rand must be apportioned to the factory. If you do the 3 tenths calculation, you're going to get a cal an amount of 3,000 Rand will be allocated to the showroom. And the last one, 2 over 10, will give you a figure of 2,000 Rand, which will be allocated to the Edmund cost. OK, guys, in summary, let's see what have we discussed in these lessons today. We've spoken about the ledger and the cost accounts. We've spoken about fixed costs, variable costs, and the break-even point, right? And then finally, we did some calculations for you to make it easy for you to do cost accounting. Guys, that's it for today's lesson. Please make sure that you practice, practice, practice. Because the more you do the section, I promise you, this is one section in accounting. Once you master it, it becomes really an easy section to score 100%. From me, Ashraf Patel, and the team, be good. See you next time.